much, Shirley, and thanks everyone for coming in. It's great to see um, so many people coming here, and everybody's really pleased to be able to support um, this uh, user group. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, this R package, Shiny. Let's just have a show of hands for who's heard of Shiny. Uh, <laughs> keep up your hand if you've written a Shiny app yourself. Okay, so that's good. That gives me an idea of where people are coming from. So um, for, for um, most of you have clearly at least sort of heard from it. I'm just going to start with actually showing you one of the sorts of use cases which we're putting this to, and then I'm going to uh, back up and talk about a bit more some of the theory of the things are going. And I'll just explain where this particular use case is coming from. We've um, recently been working on a uh, set of things that will estimate gross domestic product by a territorial authority. And we we're engaging with the minister and they say, we've developed these stuff, we know that you wanted it. And uh, uh, we said, you know, would, would you like to be involved in the launch? And he said, well, I want to see the data first. You know, I, don't want to, I don't want to launch something that's going to make me look really ridiculous, which is not an unfair thing. And <clears throat> we were wondering, how are we going to do this? Like the actual result, what we're going to publish, is 140,000 lines of data, you know, lots of detailed industry, detailed uh, areas, and so on. And um, luckily, uh, recently we had this project to deliver the capability to um, whip up Shiny apps quite quickly. So the solution was, we built this thing, it's taken a couple of developer days, and we'll talk back into that, that later. But basically what this sort of thing gives us the ability to do is really explore a range of data. Now underlying what's going on here is uh, just a whole bunch of R code, and it's just uh, sitting sitting on a on a computer somewhere. It's giving people a lot of flexibility to choose. In this case, a uh, which particular industry we're interested in. They can choose whether they want to see something as an index or an original dollar amounts, whether it's per capita or not. As you can see, it's all blissfully fast. It looks very nice. It's very interactive. Um, anything which you can do in R as a graphic, you can do on the screen. So uh, here we've got, um, for instance, each dot representing the year. So in the named region, you can see how growth is happening by the industries. Um, you can even let people sort of explore, choose a couple of different industries at once and see what things happen. They can play it out through over time and see things changing over time. So all of this has been done in R. It's all been done quite quickly and simply, and it's um, something which uh, really flows out of the way which we're using R for other purposes. So this is this is what I'm going to be talking about. But I'll take a step back now and say, you know, why did we end up doing this, and, and sort of how did we how did we do it? So looks like there's completely full screen things going on there. So some of it comes down to this diagram, which is one of these diagrams which really is just going to decrease people's view of my communication skills. But I like making them anyway because it actually helps me think about stuff. Some while back, people were coming to us and saying, look, you guys, you're an analytics team in the middle of MB. You're meant to be helping us develop evidence-based policy. You know, how are you going to do that? We wanted to go back to them and say, look, there's more to evidence-based policy than us giving you a few fancy graphs and access to a database. And so we tried to ask ourselves, what, what, what happens here? What's the role of, say, an analytics team versus a traditional research and evaluation team versus, in fact, all the research which is happening elsewhere in outside. We say that if you want to get to this, this spot, this evidence-based policy, there's a bunch of data around there. There's others' data, what we've got at the top there. There's our own data that we produce, and some of you will know we, we produce and publish our own tourism data and things of that sort. There's a really big job of managing all that stuff, getting it together in a way that it's got common classifications and so on. But that's a huge job, it probably deserves a bigger rectangle. Then the, the, on the research side, all of this purple stuff, there's people inside MB doing their own primary research. There's people uh, in universities and other, other government departments and so on uh, doing primary research. There's a really big job of secondary research, lit reviews, meta research, all that sort of stuff. And some of that's done perhaps by MB researchers and some we pick up from the outside. And one of the things we were trying to uh, pick up there was this idea that um, a research function is actually quite complex and there's a whole range of upstream to downstream research. 
And similarly with evaluations, there's evaluations people might do of New Zealand's own government programs, but also really importantly, there's other countries' evaluations or other ministries' evaluations. So that's what makes this step really important. This is the one that synthesizes all of that research together and then tries to apply it to the common problem. And this is where we are saying that in terms of just having data on the desktops of uh, policy advisors and ministers and so forth, some of it goes via researchers who are specialists and have all these fancy tools and so on. A lot of it comes to the latest graduate policy advisor who's the person who's been told, put together the evidence base for the options to and fro some <coughs> big sort of problem. They're the person who's told, go away, read all the literature, and uh, also the person said, oh, by the way, what's the data say? Draw us a few graphs and so on. So it's these people who are applying to the common problem, the current problem, that we needed to get this data, data in the hands of so that they could build policy. And so in terms of what our role was as an analytics team, we're thinking, well, we're these blue stuff. We get hold of other people's data, we will wrangle it and manage it for you. We will do the powerful the specialist analysis, fitting sophisticated models and that sort of stuff. But a lot of the time, people just want to play with the data, see the trend, see where things are going. It's a waste of our time to be doing that stuff. We should be giving them tools so that they can do it themselves. So the next slide just gives a bit of an idea of like the data life cycle. So it's the sort of thing you'd see in a stats agency or somewhere. The things start at the top, there's really raw data. It's, uh, it's just come straight from a survey or straight from some transactional database. There's an expensive process of collecting that and processing it, cleaning it up. The survey, you weight it, you impute things, you take out outliers, you do all that sort of stuff. And you end up with the clean, weighted, concorded microdata, which is the first stuff which is really analysis ready. That's the sort of thing which people will use if they're actually analyzing one row at a time of survey responses and so on. It's quite expensive to get it to there. But it's still not appropriate for the vast majority of users. The further you go down here, the more users there are who are capable and interested in it. Most users, in fact, are interested in data after it's been aggregated. They don't want to see, say in the case of our tourism data, the one row at a time for the people we interview in Auckland Airport, how much they spend. They want to see what's the total estimate for Chinese spend in the, in the last year. So it's when you've aggregated it up. But that's still something which can be quite difficult. It's in some user non-friendly table or a database somewhere, even after it's reached all that elaborate transformation. And uh, the increasing demand uh, from ministers and from uh, our own policy people and our senior managers and from the externals is to add value even to that aggregate data and say, we, we want this presented in a, uh, in a really user-friendly, dance in a moving sort of way that lets us control what we're looking at so I can choose whether I'm looking at Chinese tourists, spend or Indians uh, but yet doesn't give us so much flexibility that I'm A, going to be overwhelmed with the choices or B, uh, hurt myself by doing something which is not sensible. So there's quite an art to building these things in a way that uh, people can have the flexibility to mix and match data sets, choose what they want uh, all those user things without just giving them you know, a big Excel pivot table and saying drag and drop your own fields in ways that they will uh, end up applying filters they didn't mean to and things of that sort. So part of our general approach to dealing with all of this thing is um, uh, this is what's really evolved for us over the last sort of two and a half years. And, um, should give credit to Dragonfly in particular because a lot of it has actually come out of uh, uh, some of our interactions with them, uh, adopting some of their models. We've got, as you can see here, this huge warehouse of everything you need and whole lots of things that most people don't need. There's a bunch of messy data that for one reason or another is one off or ad hoc or it's going to be difficult to put in the warehouse. What we've realized is that if you build a user interface to the big warehouse, it might be all structured, it might be all good data, but it just overwhelms people. What they want is a much more filtered, tidy, much smaller set of data that is actually relevant to their problem. Now, it still might be a huge data set by most people's uh, readings. Uh, we've got one which we've brought in for regional economic activity report, which has got 100 different data collections in them. Many of them are uh, um, uh, got very you know, high numbers of dimensions and so on. But the point is, once you've got this relevant data set, database, you can use it for the range of things. 
So reports, we're increasingly right now reports in LaTeX, so they can be programmatically spun out from the database. Fancy web tools of the sort like that first one which I showed you, or even fancier custom built ones, which um, uh, um, might give an even more sort of polished experience. Rough and ready analytical tools, things which can be delivered to the desktops of, of our internal users, giving them good access to all of this data, we've tied it up for them, but perhaps without the polish for the external world. Then the custom analysis, the more sophisticated stuff, applying the econometrics, the statistical modeling, and so on. Now, because this thing is done programmatically, clean up all the data, put it into there, and then these things need to all be done programmatically as well, so that when we get a new data set, we push the button, and uh, everything gets updated, whether it's the web tools, the reports, written in later, coming out as PDFs, or if we want to repeat whatever fancy custom analysis, do that for the new data that's come in. So in terms of those bits there, the web tools <coughs> and the things from people's desktops, we, um, we went to our IT area and basically said, you know, we, we know there's a need there, this, this, you know, what, what can you do for us? And so they set up a project we basically told them it needs to be cheap, you need to be able to spit up one of these things in less than a day, that sort of made their jaws drop a bit. Um, so this, this is what, what we really need. And um, it needs to be able to use all the fancy things which people are getting used to because you see them on the web all the time now. You're moving and dancing things and everything from tool tips to zooming in on your Google Maps type stuff. It's got to have basically an unlimited range of graphics. We didn't want to be limited to the things which Microsoft see fit to put in some reporting tool. We want to be able to pretty much do anything. If we had to create a custom graph, we want to be able to do it because we do get asked, particularly by our internal clients, all the time to come up with innovative custom graphics which we've never seen the like of before. And neither have they when they ask them, but you know, we <laughs> work iteratively and come up with something. And we wanted to involve no IT projects. So basically we said, we want one IT project, we want that to be end of it. So um, and I'll show you why in a minute. We wanted to integrate the way we did all of our existing analysis. So if possible using the same or similar tools. And we wanted everything to be, as I was saying before, could be in this tool chain that was easily reproducible, scalable, and updatable. Uh, so IT guys were very supportive of this. The CIO said, look, our job here is to give you a big, safe swimming pool that you guys can swim around in. So, and then you, know, you can do that cheaply, and quickly, and efficiently. Building the swimming pool might be expensive, and it might be more expensive than it should be, but once it's there, you'll be able to use it. So that was, that's basically what's behind this, this part of the objective, to, to basically put something so that under business as usual, without all the project infrastructure, we can do what we need to do. So we ended up choosing Shiny, which is this RStudio product, so RStudio, the firm, who wants to produce RStudio, the software. And, um, uh, basically, one of the first things which uh, we're asked, uh, or which we asked ourselves really, when we were sort of looking at this, is some of the things we wanted to use this for, despite saying we want all these advanced statistics and so on, actually weren't much more than glorified Excel pivot tables. So saying, what's the advantage over that? Well, they're up there. First of all, you can view it in the browser, so the, the uh, customer doesn't have to download a whole data set file of Excel. They just go in the browser and look at something. It's much easier to make reproducible. If you've been in the past with distributing Excel products where a mistake creeps in in that, those last steps of putting the data across, it's much easier to polish the user interface. Now, you can make a really good professional looking Excel user interface, but it's actually quite a bother, whereas more or less out of the box, uh, these things look quite good. You use the full range of R graphics and the full range of anything you can get from JavaScript more or less easily, um, some more easy than others. You've got full control over things like tooltips. So you hover over a, a point to get it to say what you want, whereas in Excel you're limited to say what Microsoft thinks that you want to. And more, more really importantly for us, it integrates into our workflow. So like our guys are producing graphics and so on in R um, as part of their normal exploratory process and they're checking as they build databases and so on. So those, the code that's used to make those graphics and quite easily adapted into uh, into one of these shiny apps. 
terms of some of the other things which were assessed, and so this is where some of the cost of the project went into assessing these things to be sure that we're going for the right option. It was uh, basically more traditional business intelligence tools, um, and then there's things like Tableau and then there's SAS Visual Analytics. So um, first of all, because of ours at the back end, you've got the full range of everything R can do, which is pretty much more than anything else. Again, it's again, it integrates the workflow better than some of these other tools. It could be basically built by my team. So this is an important part of you've got a bunch of statisticians who are using R all the time. Even if R isn't the best tool sometimes for something, it is the tool that they're familiar with and they're already learning enough languages that, that they don't necessarily want to learn anymore. Um, it's easy to publish the code open source. So like for that first app I showed you, the Territorial Authority GDP, when we publish that, we're going to publish all the code that builds the estimates in the first place and also the code that builds the app. If we are working with Microsoft SSRS or Tableau or something, that's a hard, it's not impossible, but it's a harder thing to do. And it's much cheaper licensing costs. Now the other option is the really polished handcrafted uh, option. And in some way, that's like basically building your own HTML, JavaScript sort of web page. Um, similar to the regional economic activity report, which in fact, Dragonfly and others, the Dragonfly um, built, built for us. <coughs> the main advantage over that is just the cheapness of the development time. And so that's the knock one of these things up in half a day sort of requirement. So, in terms of the actual solution for anyone who's thinking about doing one of these for a government department, Basically what we've ended up in is, is three different ways of doing this. So development just takes place on my team's computers, which are just Windows machines, and they're just bog standard government office computers. And uh, they use open source R, R Studio, and the open source version of Shiny, just as straight off CRAN. For our internal apps, um, we set up this Linux server, and um, doing that, cost about 15 grand for the actual just set up, maintenance, a few thousand dollars a year. And we're uh, purchasing, not trying to serve a professional, 15,000 US a year gives us license for 40 simultaneous users. Which is cheaper than a lot of BI products, but it's still, um, it's still reasonably pricey. So that whole internal solution by our standards was actually more expensive than we thought we were going to be doing. And that's basically uh, the price we're paying for hosting all internally so we've got all of the security and everything ourselves. Now we also have an external solution which is basically for obviously things which we want to publish. And that's just being done straight through the platform as a service offered by RStudio and that is hugely cheaper. Uh, zero setup costs and costs about 200 US dollars per month and they look after everything for you. The host the server, it's uh, Amazon Elastic Cloud Computing so it would expand if necessary and unlimited users, and uh, as I say, no, no setup costs. So if we, if we hadn't been worried about wanting to host secure sensitive data internally, we could have gone for just this and it would have been very, very cheap. But um, uh, the extra costs come with persuading the security guys that it is actually okay to release data when it is designed to be published. So um, that's the end of that. I just wanted to show you another couple of things of, um, uh, of the sort of functionality which we're getting out of it. <coughs> and I'm quite happy to show you um, a little bit. But when I first was down to do this talk, I was thinking, oh, I'll show people how to build a Shiny app and so on. There's actually a stack load of uh, tutorials and so on out there on the web already. This sort of thing that's probably easier to sit down and read on your own screen than have me sort of flicking through this script and that script. But I'm very happy to give like a really brief sort of overview of basically how simple it is and how much it is just like um, writing R normally. So, but if I um, uh, just show a couple of these other things, this this is a this is definitely one of the quick and dirty internal sort of app options. And basically, this is working as a front end to um, that data warehouse we had, the one, the big, big one with all the data you need and the whole bunch that you don't have. And basically, what it's doing is programmatically, uh, 
in an event-driven way pushed by the user, doing pretty much the same sort of process Michelle was doing. So this is just a ggplot plot with a couple of facets. What it basically is doing is let's per people choose a, a whole bunch of data, in this case the accommodation survey. Within the accommodation survey there's lots of different cuts which are possible. These are basically ones published by Statistics New Zealand. If I choose one of those cuts, in that case actual by accommodation, by type, by variable, it will, it will basically it downloads that data from our database, so, so it did that just in that second. It looks at the data, sees how many dimensions there are in it, and then decides for itself, what sort of plot do I want to draw? And it says, well, there's actually two dimensions I need to distinguish here, much as in Michelle's data. So I'm going to map one to color, I'm going to map one to the facets. And, um, and that little bit of thinking as it did was while it tried out a couple of different plots before it decided on that. Now, much the same as Michelle did, we can uh, change the color scheme if you want. So I can choose the actual official ND color scheme there's also an old Ministry of Tourism colour scheme which we still keep around for sentimental reasons. And because R is lying in the background, the full statistical capabilities of R can be basically at anyone's fingertips. So for instance here, the same way that um, uh, Michelle was uh, added like the geom smooth to show a line, basically exactly the same, it, it, written in a R code somewhere that says plus geom smooth, gets activated if I click on one of these. If I choose a rolling average, it, it calculates the rolling average. If I say I want to see it seasonally adjusted, it does that geom smooth with SE equals false, same as Michelle had, and it's just seasonally adjusted that stuff on the fly and put it up there. And um, if I, I can you know, let the facets change, the, and uh, um, so that give people a little bit of control over that, and the users can, can um, say to them, they can change the theme so it looks like how the economist does its stuff, and things of that sort. So basically, what this is giving us is full access to um, all the power of R for um, uh, complete non-specialist users to be able to basically have the machine sort of write ggplot code in the background. So that's, that's another one of our use cases. The final one I will just sort of show is. Um, so, um, Peter, on that one, what's the little box on the right here? Um, that one there, the little input for this one. Ah, yeah. uh, right, yeah. <coughs> that's, that's one of the things that makes it a little bit less polished. It's basically um, in, in the database, there's the, the database is all structured, in, in, it's a single database which is trying to hold basically the sum total of economic data we'd ever be interested in. So one of the columns in the, the, the main view of the data is the unit. In this case, all the units are just dollars. So um, it's a same set one or more, but there's only dollars to choose from. But some of the data sets have got, for instance, dollars and maybe number of rooms or something. Um, just going to find one. Yeah, so, so uh, sometimes, and sometimes you need to say, no, I'm only interested in the dollars, not the number of transactions. Uh, a more prettier thing would hide that because there was more than one option, <coughs> which is, of course, possible. It's just you know, the building you know, consents like, database will sh uh, uh, series will show you that. Yeah, building consents, yeah. And that's one to take 30 seconds to turn up. It's also a very, very big table. And this is this is running on the Linux server you have in turn. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah, that's right. And um, so the database is SQL Server, which is just a MB architectural constraint. So that has to be on a Windows machine. And the um, the Shiny has to be on a Linux server, which is a constraint of our studios. Yeah, so in this case, you can see building consents, you have the choice of uh, numbers, dollars, or square meters. So if I, um, if I remove some of them, it'll redraw. You see, it redraws pretty quickly because it's downloaded all of that whole data set into R. Uh, okay, so it's redrawn, but there's nothing to show. But 
Could you cache the underlying database views onto the Linux server? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm moving on. Yeah, moving on. So this is uh, this is just I know I know it's silly to turn off faces, but it's actually just to illustrate that anything you can do in R, you can do with one of these. So like the the app which is behind this is uh, literally about twelve lines of R code that just draws turn off faces, and if you search faces in R, you'll get code that shows you how to do it. And um, and then there's a, a another script which basically lets you say which thing is going to be the uh, part of the hair or whatever. And so this is this is one of the offshoots of our regional economic activity report project. We decided not to replace the R E A R with this. Although we were sorely tempted. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so it's it's really just an illustration of um, whatever you can do in R you can do in one of these. So you, you want to draw your box plots or your fancy custom plots, you can do that. So I might stop there because I've probably spoken for enough and have questions, and including if someone says, show me some of the code behind the really simple shiny app, and I'll do that if you want. Which of the R packages that you use in the Right, so um, for, um, for this one, this is uh, this is basically straight ggplot stuff. So um, I'll let it recover. So your last memory of it is being dead. So this is this is you know people who use ggplot will recognise the ggplot colours. <laughs> you can that. And um, yes, that's the main thing going on there. For the um, nicer looking um, these sorts of interactive stuff, this is. Um, which got these nice transitions and so on. This is um, this is ggviz, which is actually another uh, studio open source product, which is trying to take the grammar of graphics, which is behind what the gg gg plot is, and apply it to um, uh, web-based graphics. So it speaks to a JavaScript library called Beta, and um, and it basically. It's got a vocabulary for the R user, which looks a bit like ggplot. You map an aesthetic, the x to this variable, the y to that variable, the stroke color to something else, and you render it with layers, just like in ggplot. And this is um, rather like Google does, but except you don't have to access um, Google's uh, service. Yeah, it is something similar. And um, so, um, those of you who don't know, um, there's an R package, uh, Google Viz, which basically gives R bindings to the API published by Google that does a whole lot of nice web graphics. And um, that interacts quite well with Shiny as well. So this, this is an example of a Google Viz graphic. This is a motion chart showing, in this case, the relationship between government expenditure and R&D and business expenditure and R&D over time for different things. So you can see here we've just embedded that in a, in a little shiny app. So Google Viz is what produces this sort of micro animation and interactivity. And shiny is, in this case, we're just sitting on the outside to control things like what, what which variables are your options. And, um, You've got trails to You've seen trails. So it was doing trails just for um, New Zealand. Oh, okay. So, um, oh, I see. Very still. New Zealand, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, obviously the idea behind all of this stuff is just to get the guys, the, our <coughs> policy clients, play with it. And so the more ways we can do that, the better. And the Google Viz API is often a really nice way to do it because it's got these nice looking things. We wouldn't use this one for external use because it relies on Flash. So it doesn't work on iPads. 
and uh, plus there's a whole movement there to get rid of flash for various reasons. But having things work on iPads is mission critical for us because um, our main minister uses an iPad all the time. <laughs> so I have a question back here. I had a question which kind of has been answered during the talk, but well, R is not particularly known for its speed, and I was wondering if you ever know, run into the limitations of that. You mm -hmm. kind of saw it just now when you think of the but could you give an indication of in what data volume it starts to maybe become too slow to handle for a technical yeah, it hasn't been a problem yet. And like what happened just then, I think wasn't so much our fault as was the was the the architectural model we had of bringing down all the data from the server and then drawing a graph with it. And um, but we use a combination of R and SQL. So the SQL is doing stuff from the server. In this case, for convenience, it's bringing it all into R. Once it's all in R, R would be fine. But it's the um, as moving from one server to the other that, that causes the problem there. The other solution might be, as Sean was saying, copy the, um, so if the data was on the same server, that would probably be helpful as well. In terms of what data size it can handle, if you just give it more RAM, it, it can do anything which we need it to do, um, but not, you know, it's not a Hadoop cluster, but it's like the sort, the sort of things which we want to visualize, we're normally talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of rows. Um, going up to 100 million rows is, is no problem at all. So, um, and we don't often deal with more than that. And if you do, conventional visualization is not going to work anyway because you come up with limits for how many pixels there are on the screen. So you need to do some summarizing and binning or something before you render it anyway. I was going to mention that R's limitations are mainly about RAM. So desktop apps are typically an unknown resource for most, most, of, most desktops now. Whereas your server presumably has got lots of RAM. Funnily enough, actually, less than our desktops do it. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have specs up desktops. Yeah, there are actually projects that go on to make a whole lot more stuff, a whole lot more efficient. I don't know how it's far away from it, but yeah. Q Q T seems to be the um, mm -hmm. way to um, mm -hmm. do very efficient graphics. Yes, uh, yes, Q T looks impressive. R itself is much better than it used to be. Even the last couple of years, the last few versions of R have made big improvements in its memory management. So I was going to ask you feedback from from other you know, outside of your group. Yeah, at India or and or the ministers. Have you shown these things to Yes. And what, what are they helping? No, no they, they, they love it. As far as to say, this is the future we were promised 10 years ago. How come this hasn't <laughs> been on our desktops before? <laughs> They're questionnaire, you know, that's the <laughs> questionnaire. Yes. Yeah. So it was like um, when you go to. Um, uh, this one, I you know, they, they sort of feel that. Um, you know, 10 years ago, people were telling them this stuff is possible. And then um, it sort of never happened. And I think a lot of people get stuck back up there. And um, for us, actually, the key innovation process-wise isn't so much up here, but it's doing this stuff properly. Because um, uh, there, there exists thing like there's Microsoft tools and, and so on, which can make nice graphics and so on. The trick is putting the right data in there in the right way and so on. And um, yeah, that's why this stuff is so important. So one of the limitations with that, that really flexible one where you choose a data set and it draws a graph and so on for you, which is basically feeding straight off from here. People don't like that one so much. And the reason why is because um, it's like you've taken the problem of there being overwhelmingly too many data sets all over the place to there's overwhelmingly too many data sets in one big warehouse. And so they want to know, for instance, what's exports of essentially GDP. They don't want to drop down a list with 100 different ways of measuring exports and 200 different ways of measuring GDP. They want someone to have picked the right exports, the right GDP, and done it for them already, which actually leads nicely to, um, I'll show you um, one last 
uh, one of these apps, which does exactly that. So this is this is a shiny app as well, but it's a slightly different philosophy. It's a bit more like a traditional web page. It's got less stuff being done on the fly by R. And instead, these various images are actually static SVGs, which is just drawing on as as assets. But and the reason for that is because it's this is basically the MBA outcomes framework. There's a hundred different indicators. If you know anything about MBA, it's hugely diverse. It covers everything from are uh, immigrants satisfied with their lives after being here for a year through to exports as a percentage of GDP. And so basically we're taking all of those indicators and saying, here is the, the official way of measuring exports as a percentage of GDP. You don't need to worry about you know what it is or here is the foreign direct investment measure. And so the, the, the cleverness of this is more that it's really easy and efficient for R to do all the data management and produce all of these graphs to make them look nice and a good theme and so on. And it's easy for it to do things like fit time series <coughs> models to the wall and say, how are we going against the target? Which is what some of this gray area stuff is doing. The orange dot, the target. Yes. Yeah, so in, in, in this case, we're probably not going to read them, right? <laughs> but the, um, and, uh, you know, you can combine it with a bit of, um, you know, a little bit more sort of interactivity and so on. So in this case, let many people choose which, which are the um, uh, various measures, assuming we'll find one where I've actually got some data in this one, so it's only half completed this, where, um, uh, it's sort of like adding up, saying how well are you going against all the measures under this indicator and so on. So this is something which you know we're in two minds about, like actually might be better as a traditional web project, because there's not that much R going on in there. Um, but it is really easy to develop in R. And it does fit nicely in with our workflow. And it means when they're developing it, no one needs to leave whatever they develop R in which is our studio for most people, James the first name, Code Plus Plus. We have a good question. So I just, uh, just wonder how long do you pick um, for you to train people to use Shiny for such a um, product? Well, we have quite an intensive training uh, program uh, in our team and across MB. And every week we do, we do one hour training se seminars and we focus on different aspects. So for the last well, uh, for the last six, seven months, we've been focusing on web technologies, moving them through basic HTML, um, the concepts of the internet, and um, uh, C uh, CSS or CCS type of, type of stuff. Then into um, developing up Shiny, so that um, our, our people who come from a come from a, a diverse range of, of backgrounds are now getting a really good grounding in how to build web technologies. So basically for someone who is a good R programmer already, um, in session two out of two one hour training sessions, they were producing this, which is actually basically what we then polished up into um, for use in publication. So it's like if, you're, if, if you've got people who are good with R already, it's a, it's a really easy step. So uh, this one, you can see, it's pretty simple. The only interactivity is they can choose which country they're seeing the tourism <coughs> forecast for. But it's effective, and it, um, uh, yeah, as I say, it was developed very easily. So could this stuff really easily be taken over by a number of, um, uh, sorry, another government department or Crown Research Institute and sort of tailored to their own requirements? Yes. Yes, very easily. And is that happening? No. <laughs> <laughs> Some but of us came here so that we could get that started. Yeah. Um, <coughs> did you just address what you use for source control and that sort of testing? Yeah. So um, in the team, we um, we use Git to control all of our source. And that's essential because um, particularly with working with teams, <coughs> you need to keep track of who's doing what and changing version control and so on. And um, we basically, uh, development happens uh, uh, basically on the land. There's a master repository somewhere on the land. People have <coughs> their own phones and they can push and pull changes. It's like the software development world. 
and then deploying is a last sort of stage, but we, we always have a test and a production version of the deployment as well. Because one, the, one of the hitches is that, because the development's all happening on Windows machines, occasionally you get a hitch that something that works fine on the, the Windows machine doesn't work on the Linux machine, so you need to have that final step of testing there as well. But there's no limit on how many, uh, um, on, it's easy to set up your test side. So. But um, the answer is no, not because other people are recalcitrant or because we're selfish, um, but because this is all very, very new for us. So this forecast one is the first one of ours that actually went live, and as you can see, it's really sort of super simple, and we want to do much better and more interesting, and that was only a month ago. So all, all, of, the, all of the things which I've seen today got developed in the last two months. Well, two to six months. <laughs> <laughs> So you just got, I mean, have you uh, had discussions with Australian government departments about what they might do in some areas? No. Oh, well, we, we talk, we've, we've got counterparts, particularly in tourism. And so we, we've talked and shown them this stuff, and they like it a lot. And um, some Australian government departments are going down a very similar route, we know, but we haven't talked to those particular ones. We also know the World Bank and USA are both using Shiny to... Uh, as part of their dissemination strategies. It particularly integrates well with JavaScript maps, like the leaflet library, if anyone knows about JavaScript. It gives you these beautiful, slippery maps. You can zoom in and out. You can overlay layers on. Um, Shiny speaks quite well to that. So, so when are we going to get to pamphlets given out that you can have these um, um, graphs on the pages and interact with them directly using your fingers? In the future. <laughs> yeah, that's what a smartphone is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've got to transform a, a smartphone on a printed page. <laughs> I'm, well, it's just a matter of having a screen, isn't it? <laughs> so, one more question. Yeah, um, um, probably any questions. Just wondering how many people you've got now in, who are our project, who are writing our project? In the team, probably. Well, and has that grown significantly? <laughs> it certainly feels that way. It does, doesn't it? We've had um, hardly any, any staff churn. So all of the people that are in our team have pretty much been there for the last two, two years. Uh, so they've been, they've been fully exposed in, in our programming for the last two years. And now they're, they're more programmer developers than, than they were. They come from a, a, a diverse background. We've got geneticists, psychologists, uh, uh, musicians. So uh, none of our people, uh, except for me, who's got first uh, stage one computer science, none of our people have computer science backgrounds. And uh, yeah, uh, we're all cooking and, and making stuff like this. So outside of um, our team, there's about 20 to 30 people who use R at least a bit, of whom probably about six are serious users. So it's definitely focused in, in our team. The other areas that's more like what I think is more common pattern in uh, public service is where like people might use Excel as their main workbench, and then they use SAS or R for really specialist jobs that you can't do in Excel. Where so the difference is R team uses R for everything. Do you find you have um, time to spend with modelling aspects of data analysis? as well as all the sort of presentation and exposing it to, to other users? Um, probably like a lot of other people in the world, we keep saying, right, in you know, the next six months when we finish this, we're going to do more of the actual analysis. <laughs> we, we actually think this really is going to be the case in the next <coughs> six months. But yeah, we, we, do, we don't have as much. But that's to a large degree because the last two years, we've had 14 IT projects while we've gotten all of this infrastructure in place. We think we are now in this space where um, we're ready to start really using it rather than um, building it, and um, so that's going to be really quite good.